everyone. Welcome to MetalNet. I'm very excited to have Cher Ross of Vixen with me today. Hi, Cher. How are you? I'm good, Sarah. How are you? I'm doing well. That wasn't even appropriate uh, beginning because you've actually you're in like a million bands even right now and you've been in probably a bajillion bands like since you started your career. Um, but Vixen is one of them. And tell me the other bands that are active that you're in right now. Sure, sure. So right now, um, Vixen, as you said, of course, and then also um, Twin Flames Radio, the band I have with BAM, um, which we put out an album in 2019. I was going to say last year, but that's no longer last year. Oh, there it is. Yeah, baby. Yeah, very, very proud of that. And um, and then I'm also the bass player for Joe Elliott from Def Leppard um, and his band called The Down and Out. That's awesome. And congratulations. Okay. Yeah. You guys won an award. Um, not too yes. long ago. Was it the best yes. British best, best, best British album, album of the year? That's amazing. That's yeah. Amazing. And I, I sent him a little note saying, are you, are you sure I'm entitled to this? Because I'm like the Yankee in the band. <laughs> I know, yeah, I know. Like they must have like um like only certain number of people cannot be British in order for this. Oh, I know, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. It's funny. You're the only one though. You're the only American, right? Yeah. 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 I'm the only yank, or as they call it, septic, because it rhymes with yank. Yank rhymes with tank, septic tank. So uh, the lovely term for a Yankee is to be called a septic. Not very nice. Don't like that. <laughs> That's not very nice. Well, hopefully they don't call you that. <laughs> there you go. I don't, I don't think they do. They're very That's cool. Very cool. <laughs> That's awesome. So well, congratulations on that. And um, I want to ask you, I kind of want to start with the beginning because um, Pam, I actually interviewed Bam last week, as you know, and we got to see you a little bit, nice little cameo from you. Um, and Bam had actually mentioned that your mom was a piano teacher. Um, and so I actually yeah. did not know that about you. So I assume that your mom would have taught you her gift. And I wanted to know, A, is that true? And how old were you when you started? Oh, yes. Going way, way back. Way back. Yeah, that's awesome. Back. Yeah. Yeah. My mom was, um, I was actually named after her. She was a performer. Oh. And yeah, her name was Vera and she hated that name. So she thought Sharon was a really awesome name, which is my legal name, obviously. And so um, she performed all over um, the Midwest until she was pregnant with um, one of my older brothers. And then she stopped because, you know, she didn't want to be like the pregnant lady back in the I don't know when that was the fifties, I guess. And so, um, she, you know, just decided she just couldn't help it. She was like a natural musician. She was a family of seven brothers and sisters. So she was one of the seven oh, wow. and all seven of them and her parents were all musicians. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, it was just sort of a given, like, um, every time, any aunt or uncle on her side came over or my grandparents came over, there was a jam session. And we all sat around pianos and organs and guitars. And my grandfather played um, uh, Hawaiian lap steel guitar and um, everybody could sing, everybody could sing harmony. My grandmother played piano and organ. I mean, just everybody played, played, played. So yeah, I started on piano when I was four and it was, just, you know, it's one of those things, you know, when you're four years old, you don't think that's spectacular or special or anything, you know, it was just the piano was there and my mom was there and this seems fun. <laughs> yeah, this is cool. I get to hang out with my mom and make fun sounds, you know, so, um, so it just became this thing that she and I bonded over and um, eventually I explored other instruments and I, there was violin along the way and um, I was, but I was really training to be a classical pianist. Um, early on and that was my ambition super super young like I think by the time I was six or seven I was all I was all about it oh wow and uh, yeah it was crazy and then um but then my brothers you know being older brothers they're playing me Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones and, <laughs> and I was like I don't know if I want to do this classical music thing I like this other stuff <laughs> and uh, eventually you know that just sort of turned into a trying out a lot of different instruments and um my mom also played upright bass so um she was kind of a character in her own right god bless her um so so I got really used to hearing all these different instruments and eventually um I think a bass guitar was probably my I don't know 
50th instrument besides piano. And my parents were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a crappy bass from, you know, I don't know where they got it, Sears or something. It was like 50 bucks. You couldn't even hear the notes. It was horrible. It was literally horrible. But they were just like, if you stick with it, you know, and you actually stay with it, you know, we will consider helping you get another bass. Well, within a matter of like two months or something, I had been offered the job in like the coolest band in my school. Yeah. So, so then I was like, please, 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 can I have a bass? Please, please, please. please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So then we started playing all these gigs and everything. And, and then, um, and that was, I still remember, you know, that our band was Broken Arrow and it was Sam, Scott, Dick, and me. And um, I, it was really weird. I grew up in Minnesota and the school I was in, we had four bass players, like all kind of around my grade. This is high school. Three of us were chicks. Go figure. It was so weird. It was just so weird. So I just had this environment where- Four bass players is kind of weird because I feel like, I feel like when I was in school, everybody was a guitarist and then somebody had yeah. to become the bass player. Right, right. right. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Yeah, it's weird. There was, um, there was four of us who were bass players, and everybody was pretty good too. It wasn't like um, pretending to play bass. Like everybody was, they were pretty damn good. So um, competition was fierce in my town to get the gig in Broken Arrow. That was like the the coolest band in the school. It was like, oh my god, I'm in Broken Arrow. It was like amazing. So that was like the pinnacle of my youth, I think. <laughs> so how old were you when you picked up the bass um I was 15 15 okay yeah 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 but you know after having played piano for so many years um bass is it's just not that I mean it was a different process for my hands obviously <laughs> but under you know I already knew all the music in theory without knowing I knew the music in theory kind of you know what I mean yeah, so yeah. you yeah. had been playing music for years, so that was just a matter. Yeah, of, yeah. So did you yeah. did you stay with the bass because there was some connection with the bass, or because you had the situation where you got in this great band and now you're the bass player and this this works for you? Um, it was kind of both. There was there was two things going on at once. So I was in the the cool rock band of my town, which was a relatively small town, but it was still very cool. So there was, you know, prestige involved. So that felt really good. Obviously, you know, my ego was like, oh, hello. Yes, I like this. More, please. And then um, I also became the bass player for the um, singing group at my school. And they were like this award winning um, jazz group. And so that was super challenging to play bass for because it was just like, you know, it was really complicated stuff compared to being in the band with Broken Arrow. Mm. And so um, that got more and more intense. And the director for that group pulled me aside one day and said, look, you're really good at the bass. You ought to consider going to Berklee College of Music in Boston. And he handed me back then, it was Downbeat Magazine, and he handed me the, the ad in the magazine, because there was no internet, of course. And he handed me this magazine. He goes, here, you should read about this and blah, 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 and, and write to them, which I did. And you had to apply and send a cassette tape and all this stuff. And so that was really the turning point. Um, Berklee College of Music accepted me, and I had to decide if I was a bass player or a guitar player. Okay. Cause I was still, I was flirting with guitar at that time. Okay. And, uh, and so I was, it was really just like, <laughs> it was the basic knowledge that there's always less bass players than guitar players. That was really the deciding factor for me. Plus the fact that I, I just always am drawn to the bass. I'm just always like, that's the part I would pick out in every song. I would just hear it. And so those two things, it was like, well, I'll always have a gig if I'm the bass player. And then I can always hear it. So I kind of went with the bass. And sure enough, I went to Berkeley. I think I was 17 years old. I went up to Berkeley. It was very eye-opening, extremely, you know, like you're there with all these, like, you know, when you're 17 and somebody's 20, that it feels like a humongous age gap. Right. And then they're musicians. So they've got a substantial amount of playing under their belt, more so than I did. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was several situations where I was really thrown under the bus mm -hmm. and had to, you know, stop, you know, wipe away the tears and get back and figure out how to, how to play that or how to do that. You know, teachers, other players would, they just, 
they don't care how old you are. They didn't care where you came from. They don't care how nice you are, whether you can play or you can't. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was definitely not a situation of you can't be good enough for a girl, a race, a religion, a belief. You're either, you either cut it or you don't. Okay. So that was very um, eye-opening and I really had my ass kicked. <laughs> But I'll, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was, I was going to say that's where I really got introduced to to, to different music. Because mm -hmm. having grown up in you know Lakeville, Minnesota, I had never heard um, so so many different types of music. I just wasn't exposed to it. If it wasn't on the radio or my friends didn't have that album, I didn't. I never heard it. Right. So I really got into you know um, I don't know just. I guess the two most influential albums were Jaco Pistorius' and solo album because he was a fretless bass player. Mm -hmm. And then um, somebody played me Stevie Wonder's Music of My Mind, mm -hmm. which is, I think it's the first album where he played almost every single instrument. And it just, it literally just blew my ears wide open. Yeah, awesome. I That's was cool. gonna ask, um, at Berkeley, um, and I think this happens to a lot of kids who go to like a music school or any kind of art school yeah was there any sort of sense of like okay I'm in my town I'm one of like a small group of really amazing musicians and everyone thinks I'm really cool because I'm so good and now you're at Berkeley and like every good kid from every school all over the world is there and like you're not automatically the best one anymore like was that part was that part of it too or was it even just beyond that of just being able to keep up <laughs> um you nailed it and then beyond that more yeah, yeah, it was like, it was it sort of like having the curtain lifted on what's possible, mm -hmm. because if you don't know what's possible, then you don't know where you are on the spectrum. Right. So realizing what was possible and going, holy shit, wow, I'm just like average. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was very eye-opening, very, very eye-opening. Um, one of my um, friends from Berkeley College of Music and we just became best friends and we would just hang out in the you know they have these little practice rooms with pianos in them and amps or whatever and and we would just go lock the door in there and she was this chick um, Rachel Z is what she goes by now and she's had a phenomenal career so I just want to give her a shout out she was the musical director for Wayne Shorter she toured with Peter Gabriel um, she has a band with her husband now Omar Hakim and she is just amazing literally amazing yeah so was she was she your buddy for a good chunk of your yeah adventure? yeah <laughs> yeah 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 totally totally That's yeah awesome. yeah 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 she's phenomenal boston you so because i'm a boston girl so i totally know about berkeley you know because ah. every musician that i grew up with thought about it at least you know going yeah and um so how did boston treat you and, and how different was it from minnesota oh man it was like super different it was crazy <laughs> Yeah, I felt like a farm girl in, you know, in Boston. I was just, I was literally like fresh off the, off the boat, so to speak. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, but I loved it. I, I had my first slice of pizza and, you know, I was in, I was in heaven. I would take the, some bus or train or something up to New York City and go to jazz clubs and sneak my way in and you know I just I had a blast are you kidding 17 years old on my own <laughs> in Boston yeah. hello uh, yeah I had a blast I mean looking back I was like basically a really good kid I just wanted to hear the music yeah yeah you weren't trying yeah. to get in trouble but you had adventures to that you needed not to really play. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's awesome yeah, so yeah can totally. I assume that you finished because I know a lot of people who start Berkeley don't end up finishing at Berkeley did you make it through the four years <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that disrespectfully but I oh there's no literally, there's literally a book that I read once and it was like these are all those people, yeah. amazing people these successful people went to Berkeley and like I swear to you all the ones all the chapters I read were like Steve Vai who was asked to leave and like all yeah. these other people who basically didn't make it through but you 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 did the four years or how, whatever yeah. your program was no, you didn't? not at all. So what happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I went that summer and then I went back to high school and I started just practicing my bass eight hours a day because I, I had realized the possibilities and everything. And I wanted to be the super duper amazing, whatever, jazz genius. And, um, and then um, 
Then I dropped out of high school. Okay. Yep. So I was, then I was like, mom, dad, not interested. Don't care. Just want to play my bass, whatever. Wow. And, um, I started, um, I think that was like October or something, October, November. Um, and the school, it was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I know what I'm doing. Get out of my face. <laughs> and, um, and so then I had to, uh, appease you know my dad was like well if you're not going to go to school you have to get a job so I started hunting and auditioning for everything I could and not much would me until I turned 18 because mm -hmm. you're not allowed in a you know in a bar or whatever right. and um so I, I had some little pickup gigs here and there and then the day I turned 18 a band was waiting for me and I went on the road literally like bye mom bye dad and hopped into a van and just went on the road. And then meanwhile, I set up to take my GED, got my GED, and then I went back to Berkeley College of Music that summer or that fall. I can't really remember now. Um, I lasted one semester. Okay. <laughs> I was just, I, I just wanted to get in it. You know what I mean? I wasn't like kicked out like Steve I was or anything, <laughs> but I knew that, um, I don't know. I just needed to just do it. I just needed to play. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I didn't want to be, yeah. I didn't want to be bent deal. over. Yeah, I think, yeah, I was like, I don't want to write um, charts for orchestras and blah, blah. I just want to play. I just want to go play. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so some yeah, of those amazing play. experience for you, but it, you just needed to be there long enough to have the, the, the gates of what is possible open to you. Right. It was up, up to you to just make it happen for yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think like from, from that time, then I moved back to Minnesota, um, got an apartment in Minneapolis and started auditioning like crazy. I think it was like two weeks or something. And I had like a bunch of jazz gigs. I was just like playing all over the place, just all over Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So yeah. I know that, um, I believe that Jan Keenemond was also from Minnesota, but yes. I also know that you were the last of the original lineup to join Vixen. And I always assumed that all happened in LA. So did Correct. you have a connection to Jan in Minnesota or was it just a coincidence that by the time y'all ended up in Vixen that the two of you were the Minnesota girls. <laughs> you nailed it. We didn't know each other at all in Minnesota. It was like this really strange coincidence. I mean, like, what are the odds of that? But um, but the other really strange coincidence is because they happen is Janet and Roxy have the same birthday. Yes, I actually, I remember that from the fan club, uh, which I was talking to you about earlier, because every month you would have like See, I'm such oh a my god, I can't believe you right have now. that. You know, can I just tell you, I had to clean out so much of my stuff because you know you get to a point where you're like, I want to keep it all, but I just can't. But yes. I couldn't I could never. If I get buried King Tut style, this is like buried with me. Um, I love this thing. It was, I think I bought it with my awesome. first real paycheck. I'm pretty sure I was timing it. I was trying to figure out when this came out. And because I know my parents wouldn't give me checks for stuff like that. They're like, you don't need yeah. to do that, save your money. So I'm pretty sure it was like my first job, first paycheck. And I was like, now I have the money I can join the Vixen. Wow. Wow. But what was it? What was the first paycheck? I worked at a store called Bradley's, uh, which is like, it was like a little New England chain, which is kind of like Target, which doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Okay. Um, so I was like, uh, the seasonal, you know, I got hired with like 10,000 other people and I had a boss who actually looked like she could be your older sister. No way. Crazy. I really did. And like so That's much, crazy. Of it, I'm like, you're not related to somebody named Cher, are you? And she's like, oh my God. Crazy. And I'm like, okay, I just had to ask because she looks so much like you. It oh was, my god that's so weird yeah <laughs> that's funny well i'm honored that you spent part of your first paycheck on that that's amazing <laughs> it was worth it it was totally worth it. i told that's amazing. Brit, you guys need to do i mean obviously you guys have a lot of great photo sessions with Brett and lorraine but you need to have one for like those of us who still have our folder so we can oh, have like so full the full band photo for this but yes uh, that's a really cool idea funny thing i was kind of looking through the stuff because every so often i read through it and there's something in here um so you were in vixen and then you had done um oh my god contraband you right. had started contraband so this this particular newsletter they had asked you like oh it's contraband like and we'll talk about that a teeny bit but um, they were asking you, are you doing any outside projects other than Vixen and Contraband? And you said, not recording wise, I've been playing with the drummer from Dogs Demore. And I saw that and I was like, 
oh my god like I read this years ago it never would have occurred to me that you and oh my god would be married in like a bunch oh of my god together, including uh including twin flames um twin flames radio but it wasn't that crazy like of all the, of all the people that you've probably played with at that time just the fact that you mentioned the drummer not even by name but just the drummer right right <laughs> oh my god that's so funny well that would have been our um cover band that a bunch of us had put together mm -hmm. um, called Stinky Fingers. And we just did stones and faces and small faces and humble pie covers. And uh, Bam was the drummer. Joe from the Dogs de Moore was the guitar player. My boyfriend at that time was the singer. Robert Stoddard, the original singer for Dogs de Moore and the original singer for LA Guns was the other guitar player. Um, Janet Gardner would come up and sing a bit the, the uh, sax player and keyboard player for Aerosmith would join us. And we just did all these crazy gigs um, as like an outlet because mm -hmm. we were all frustrated with the record companies. And we were like, I don't know what's going on. I just want to play. Well, I just want to play too. And so yeah. we just, I think <laughs> one night over, there was probably <laughs> alcohol involved. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that's funny. But that was that was the first time that I played with him Mm -hmm. And, um, and I still remember just being blown away um, and, and having had done so many, you know, jazz gigs and these gigs and session gigs and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, damn, that guy's amazing. So, yeah. So that was probably, I was in that headspace when I made that comment, most likely. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. So Speaking of having like kind of like a side project, um, I also found this, which was the contraband. I don't know if you could see it with the glare, but it was the contraband postcard that I'm assuming I got it because it was sort of like a vote vote for us on like dial on TV type of thing. And I'm assuming I got it because I was in the Vixen fan club. <laughs> so they probably said amazing. The, everybody and all, you know, all the band, like the LA Guns fans and the Vixen fans and the Rat fans and so on. Um, so I kind of assumed that that was another project where it was like, you guys came together because you just wanted to make music and like less pressure and you know just for fun is that is that what contraband ended up being for you guys i would love to tell you that it is and i would love for it to have been that but it was the brainchild of uh the manager that we all shared we were oh. all managed by the same guy and he wanted to launch his record company and so he decided if he would put together an all-star band, that would be the first record to be released on his record label. Okay. So it was, um, it was basically like, yeah, do this and uh, you'll have fun and you'll get paid. <laughs> and, and that was it. And then we like it barely talk to each other after that it was really bizarre it was really really weird it was, um, it was great music I think I think everybody we, remembers it and loves yeah it together and don't get me wrong we had a blast doing it you know the process of it and I would love to say that we had been in a room and had the idea but it was really about his it was really the manager's ego trip or something oh, okay. so um yeah just whatever you know but we, we did have a good time manager. you actually just had more work to do for the same manager just on kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 kind of yeah <laughs> but it was um you know it's like you put a bunch of musicians in a room and give them a reason to be there they're gonna have fun no matter what and we certainly did I mean, we had a blast yeah we definitely had a blast yeah well um so you're in i'm gonna jump a little ahead and then go go back to sure Shirley Dixon, but you and bam have twin flames radio now and um, so for you, you're balancing like three bands. So is Twin Flames, is that the escape of just creating art for the sake of art? Um, whereas like Vixen is still art, but maybe a little bit different because you're collaborating with a band. A band. Right, band. right. So is that yeah, I, is this for you guys or is it something? Definitely. Different? Yeah, Twin Flames is really the expression of, you know, the the musical evolution of where he and I are at because we've been through so much and we we, God, we've been married for 25 years this year it's hard to believe um so we we've listened to so much music together and explored so much music together you know we had a period where we only listened to cuban music and then we would only listen to indian music and we just had all these musical adventures and then there was a period where it's only punk or it's only you know what i mean it's just we just go nuts on stuff and so twin flames is kind of the 
expression of that, like wherever we're at in the moment. And then it's also like what you said, there's, there's a lot of art for art's sake, but also has to do with the production values. We um, really uh, appreciate so much, you know, something, how it sounds, the sonics and the production and the strings and the pianos and just getting into all of those pieces. So we really have a lot of fun with that. And because there's no record company and there's no, um, for I, I don't know what other word to use. There's no brand. You know, there's no expectations because it isn't, well, wait, but you've been releasing this music for 300 years and it needs to sound like, you right. know, X, Y, Z. So that doesn't fall into play. And it really allows us to have that freedom. I think ultimately, uh, and I'm sure Bam probably touched on this, um, we're children of 70s rock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had my exploration into jazz and whatever. And what got me out of the whole jazz thing was like, oh my God, I just, I'm a rocker. That's just, I have to just realize that, you know, and I can incorporate the jazz stuff into that and it has its place in it and, and place in time, you know, but, um, but really I just love seventies rock and it just makes me want to leap around the house, you know? So that's what we mostly aim to incorporate with twin flames radio. Whereas with Vixen, it does have a sound. There are expectations. There is a brand. There is an identity. You know, we, I wouldn't feel right if we wrote a song that suddenly sounded like, I don't know, can't even think of a band now, but you know, just something completely wrong. You know, it would just be like, huh, what are you doing? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's as, as a longtime fan, I love you guys and I would support you and buy it no matter what, but there's that difference of they did something so I have to support them or they did what I expected them and what I wished for and like the right. evolution of Vixen. And, you know, Lorraine and I talked about that a bit when she came on um, and in her position, a little different, being a little different, being that she's coming in after Janet Gardner being the singer forever and right. established a voice. And, you know, one thing I really appreciated about Lorraine and you have to know I'm a huge femme fatale fan as well. So it's not just cool. a thing for me, it's a Lorraine thing. But what I really appreciate about her, she has a very particular style, which I always saw as being completely different than Vixen. Like you were female fronted and all female, but really so different. Yeah. And so I never even thought you guys would even like hire Lorraine. I was shocked. I was one of the people who was shocked. I guess other people weren't, but I totally was. But what I really love about her is that she's got her own thing with Femme Fatale um, and she's a badass and she's amazing at it, but she, she clearly respects what you guys have done in the history and that the fans are going to expect certain moments and certain songs that Janet did a certain way. And that really just trying right. to get that in there. And I, I loved her so much for that because she's a badass. She's been around, she's in her right to say, listen, I'm Lorraine Lewis and this is how I sing. And, but she's yeah. not doing that. Yeah. You know? She's like, no, I, I want to be a part of Vixen. Vixen has a, their legacy band you know, the fans expect certain moments and, and it's true. I mean, I really do. In fact, I think you guys even talked about it in some, you know, way back during Rev It Up about huh. like, I, I can't remember who was asked specifically. It may have been, have been Jan, but you know, it's sort of like we, you know, when I'm a fan and I go to see somebody play, if they totally change the song, I'm kind of like missing that connection. And that, so to try to sort of respect what the fans expect. So I, I love that as a fan that all of you really respect that we have, you know, you're going to grow and do your own thing, but we have certain expectations and yeah, we're excited and we wait. But I also totally get why Twin Flames Radio would be so special to you because then it probably makes it easier for, for you to do all that with Vixen because now you have Twin Flames where you could do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. It's like having your, your freedom, you know, yeah. and then, um, and then Vixen is more like, you know, there's a, there's a sound and there's a style and there's a thing. And then also with, with Twin Flames Radio, you know, I do a lot of the, the lead singing as does Bam. Whereas in Vixen, I'm not the lead singer. And, and in Twin Flames Radio, I play a lot of guitar as does Bam. And I play the piano and blah, blah, blah. And he swears I'm going to play drums on the, on the next record. I, I could, do. He played everything but drums. I think he, he stuck yeah. to the drum stuck on, stuff on this one. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I can, I can hit, I can lay down a solid beat, but. He's crazy. I mean, he would, he would have to just loop it. I can't, I can't play a whole song. I'm just, I'm, I can, I always say there's a difference. I can play the drums, but I am not a drummer. Mm. There's a huge difference there. Yeah. yeah, I, love yeah, that he, yeah. I love that he's encouraging you that he wants to like, 
he wants you to do it. He wants to hear you. Yeah, I know he does. I know he does. He's crazy. He's crazy. Awesome. But yeah, we, I mean, the whole point of, you know, music is to have, you know, an expression of where you're at in your life and everything. And I think both, both things are getting there. And then, um, you know, Joe Elliott's thing is that's his freedom. So the down and out for Joe is like twin claims radio for me. So I respect that for him. So for, for him, like I have a lot of freedom as a bass player, but he's really like taking the reins of, you know, that songwriting. And he's like, oh my God, I just get to like do whatever. And it doesn't have to sound like, you know, Def Leppard. Right. So, so I think that that's where he, and I'm putting words in his mouth. So don't get me wrong, anybody. And don't hate me for this. But I think that, you know, that's where he has a lot of fun with it too. And, um, and then for me, it was, that, it was a whole different genre to get to play bass to in terms of, you know, just different style and, and everything like that. And it, it was really fun though, because I would just be here at home and track it and send it off. And you know, it was good. It was good fun. Is the down and outs rooted in any particular decade? Because you talk about Twin Flames being kind of 70s inspired. Vixen started in the 80s. So there's always going to have, you're going to have that history with the 80s. Does the down yeah. and outs have a particular decade that it's attached to or a particular yes. style? Definitely. Um, Down and Out started as, um, uh, and and again, I hope I don't butcher the story, but basically, because I'm not the original bassist, they had a couple of bass players prior to me. You came in more, a few years ago. More back. like, yeah, a few years ago. Five um, years. I'm not even sure what year it was now, but anyway, yeah, so I, um, they started uh, because there was a tribute to Ian Hunter, and they asked Joe to, because um, Ian Hunter from Mott and the Hoople, so Joe just worships Ian Hunter and is super, super, super influenced by him. Very, very influenced. Mm -hmm. And so he was asked to do that. And then they were like, okay, well, I need a band, blah, blah, blah. And so he met the guys in the choir boys and they ended up doing this thing. And rather than doing all the Mop the Hoople cuts that everybody knows, like all the young dudes, they did deep cuts. Cool. And then that just turned into like, we need more of this, blah, 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 blah. And so they did, you know, an album and it was just all Mop the Hoople and Ian Hunter songs but done by joe and the guys mm -hmm. and so um that was the first two albums and i toured the second album and um, so there's a live dvd of that and a, a live cd of that but then the third album is joe's songs and that's where it takes you know a detour now now it's not mott the hoople and hunter now it's joe elliott and it's just really like joe elliott without def leppard it's right. like this is him just doing his thing and let me tell you having heard his raw tracks um that guy can sing like you would not believe i mean i know everybody says joe lick is a great singer but when i mean i just feel privileged and bam as well we would just be sitting there going oh my god he can sing lower than me or most people i know and he can sing higher and he can hold the note longer and it's full of power so for anybody who thinks Def Leppard, you know, there's all, apparently there are people who talk about their vocals live or whatever. He's a motherfucker. Joe Elliott is a motherfucker of a singer. Guy is unbelievable. Yeah. Really unbelievable. It's yeah. amazing. Oh, super so, amazing. I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I need to word there. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, love, I love when you guys get excited about each other, especially since you've been doing the same thing for almost the same amount of time. So I love, I don't know, I just always love when you guys get like giggly about like your fellow musicians and like oh, right, right, right. talent and stuff, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's really sweet to see. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and going back to, um, you know, when bands perform songs, I mean, I, I think ultimately we're we're all fans so when i'm standing on the side of the stage and i'm watching cheap trick and they go into you know surrender it better sound like the record it better not be some like weird reggae version or something you know what i mean yeah. i want to hear it the way that it was done come on you know and so that's how i feel you know in vixen as well like i want to i want to perform the songs the way that i know that the fans want to hear them yeah yeah, yeah, it's hard yeah. when you go to a show and you're like, I know I know the song. I recognize the lyrics, but what's, what's going <laughs> on? Like, oh, it's that song. Oh, the one I've listened yeah. to 10,000 times. And no yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Lorraine is nailing it. And she is a badass. And I love what she brings to the party. I love what she brings to the stage. And um, I think the last couple of years have really, uh, well, except for 2020 when there wasn't any gigs. <laughs> but <laughs> prior to that, um, I think, you know, it's really bonded the, 
the fans with her energy and everything. It's been fantastic. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Vixen went through a lot of stuff in between like the first two albums and what you guys are doing now. But for me, when, as a longtime fan, sometimes there's that feeling of like, everybody always wants like the original lineup or what have you. But when Brit and Lorraine came in and like, now it's the four of you, it just feels like Vixen. And I, I kept, yeah. saying, I kept saying this to Brit as if she was new, even though she's been in the band for a few years now, but to me, she's, you know, she kind of started off as the new person, but right. like, this to me is Vixen and I'm so excited for like what you guys are doing right now and what we're going to experience, you know, once we're able to all see each other again and go to shows and yeah, we could go to studios (laughs) and stuff. So I did want to ask you about the songwriting because one thing that I um, kind of came across in some of this older stuff was that um, at the time you guys had just put out Rev It Up and you were preparing for a third album. And I guess the writing that you would have done at the time probably didn't end up on any particular album, but you guys were paired up. And I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was you and Jan and Roxy, I'm sorry, Roxy and Jan and you and Janet. And what was yeah. interesting in what I read was that um, you and Janet, Janet at, at the moment that you did the interview was actually concentrating on the music. You were concentrating on the lyrics. And I think um, whoever did the interview said that, um, that you guys kind of were working that way at the moment and that uh, Jan and Roxy was, I guess, maybe more collaborative where they were kind of working uh, on everything at the same time. Uh, collaborative might not be the right word. Right. So I wondered, was that typical for Vixen at that time, like during the first two albums or kind of whatever writing you did, was it usually like you and Janet and, and then like Jan and Roxy, or did, was it just happened to be right. at that interview that you guys were paired up that way? Um, I think that that might have happened a lot. It's funny. I, I don't really remember that well. It feels like so long ago. Oh, go for you. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so many bands and experiences oh. and adventures. Like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm trying to like get the wheels to turn. Um, yeah, I, I know Janet and I did write a lot. And then, uh, but we would be in a room with all four of us too and come up with, you know, ideas and stuff too. So it might have just been like that day for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the day you did the interview, it just happened to be. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally good event. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny. How about now with um with Britt and Lorraine? How are you guys, how are you guys writing? Um, especially during sort of quarantine or social distance. Right. Do you guys pair up? Do you the four of you work together or is it just a lot of different ways? It's been um it's been challenging during the quarantine because um we actually ended up in four different cities. So it's pretty hard to get together with anybody. There was one point, uh, Britt and I have done some stuff together. And then me, Britt and Roxy have done some stuff together in um, studios. And then we, we did a lot of stuff with the four of us, just getting into a room and just throw down the phones and just record all these crazy ideas that we come up with. So we've just tried to do a lot of different things. Even at sound checks, we would just like jam out ideas and stuff. We were really, yeah, whatever, record us. We don't care. Um, just like we really love you know spontaneity when you're not trying to write a song and and there's something to be said for being in the room together um I would say that the whole COVID-19 thing um it made it a little bit challenging to feel creative Mm -hmm. for a lot of a lot of time you know there was initially there was the oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh what's going on and then I actually had COVID-19 and Bam had to nurse me back to health. It took, yeah, I was, I was down. I was totally down. Couldn't breathe for about three days. And then um, I stayed in bed for a month. Um, yeah. So that happened. Um, and then, and then there was sort of a panic about like, oh my gosh, how are we going to keep paying the bills? Right. So, so there, I think there was a scramble from everybody, you know, everybody in our band, you know, we don't all live off there's not some massive vixen royalties or anything going out so um so it's really like okay I got to deal with my day-to-day like I what are we going to do you know so so there was like a little bit of panic for a while um fortunately you know that's that's lifted and everybody's got things going on again now so that's good um but yeah it it definitely when you're when you're panicking about eating it's hard to feel creative I think yeah 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 so so we didn't do a whole lot of back and forth a little bit here and there but not as much as I've seen other bands do um and I'm and I'm very impressed by that I'm like wow that's amazing that they could do that 
Um, I personally, I just do better when I'm in the room with somebody. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's just the thing for me. I just, I like to feed off of a person. I really like that feeling. Yeah. 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 I, it's, I can imagine it would be very difficult. And it's funny because I've asked this of a few different people and everybody's answer is so different. Some people, I bet. I mean, most, I mean, most people say, yeah, it's kind of awkward and it's definitely not the same over Zoom. Like it's just right. not. <laughs> um, right. But, right. but some people, I, I feel like some people, it just kind of works for them. And maybe they're people who kind of worked better on their own anyhow. Yeah. They just do their thing and then say, here, share, this is what I did. Now yeah. You, yeah. Now you do something with it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, we've definitely tossed some ideas around. I mean, you know, I, I, I did some stuff all, you know, on my own and Roxy wrote the lyrics and I took the lyrics and put, you know, put them to songs, whatever. And then Brit had some stuff here that we jammed out. And then I know Brit and Lorraine were working together for a little bit because they were both in LA, but right. now Lorraine's left and she's up North in Washington. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's like the quarantine thing just kind of, kind of shifted things a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, good though. You'll, we'll, we'll get you, we'll get you writing again. Soon. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. We yeah. definitely have a lot to work with. There's so many ideas that are awesome and totally in the right path, mm -hmm. you know, the right path for the next Vixen album. There's so many ideas. We just have to go through them really. Yeah. Um, so I, I know you guys have actually played with, L L I mean, Britt's been in the band for a while, but I know you've played with Lorraine and Britt a little bit before we kind of all tucked into our own homes. How did, how is it different being on stage, knowing that you're not in one of your many bands that you've been in throughout your career, but that you're in Vixen, but you have this different singer as a very different stage style than Janet had, um, and Britt, who's also kind of fresh and new. Um, how does it feel for you as a bass player on stage? Like, do you feel like you're still maneuvering like classic share moves, classic share um, vixen moves, or does it does it kind of change the dynamics on stage a little bit with the two of them? Yeah, that's such a good question. That's why I'm <laughs> laughing. I'm like, oh my god, I don't think I'm going to ask you that. Um, I think it. It pushed me to up my game. It pushed me to up my onstage game. Yeah, I was, you know, it's really easy for me to fall into my classic share of. Oh, I love the classic share. That's like I love that. I mean, I want to see it. I want to see that still. But I imagine she's different. still there. Yeah, yeah, she's she's still there, but she had to up it. Um, yeah, no, I I kind of had to, uh, I had to up my game. Yeah, like you know, Brit really. Um, I mean, she's a lot younger than the rest of us. So she brings a lot of energy up there. And then Lorraine may as well be 22 years old because she brings a ton of energy up there. Uh, and not saying that, you know, that Janet or, or Gina or whoever didn't bring a ton of energy. It's just different. It's just different it's energy. Different. Yeah. And especially. Yeah, just totally different. And I saw you guys with Gina. Um, but and I never, unfortunately, I never get to see Jan. But to me, there was like an elegance that you, Jan, and Janet had. Like Vixen was like the elegant right. band. Like you guys just like, like it was almost like you always had like smoke and like fans, even when there were <laughs> smoking fans there. And I loved it. And it, for me, it feels more like raw, raw energy. Um, right. Now I think it's a little different because to me, Lorraine is like raw energy. And I told her she was. Um, she had talked about David Lee Roth being crotch first. Now she loved her. I was like, Lorraine, I've seen you in your crotch first too. And she's so, yes. she's so badass. Like yes. she comes out and um, very different than Janet. And I think that's why I didn't imagine uh, Lorraine in Vixen, but like, I love her in Vixen. I like yeah, yeah. dying to see the four of you guys um, together. But yeah, I did, I did wonder because there, you know, I think there's certain patterns um, that bands have who've been together for a very long time. Right. Right. And you like, yeah, it's them. true. Wait for them. You're like, oh, they did the thing. <laughs> yeah. I know. One time we were at a sound check and Roxy goes, Well, you you need to do that thing that you do. And I'm like, what thing that I do? She's like, you know that thing where you spin and you stop? And I go, is that a thing that I do? And she's like, yeah, don't you know what you do? And I'm like, no, I don't know what I do. <laughs> you should probably just ask fans because we could probably tell you like, you probably could. this is what we expect. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, send me notes, tell me what I should do on stage and then I'll do that. Okay, we're all good. Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, um, being on stage with them is, is just super fun. And I don't, I don't know that, um, it's like playing the Vixen stuff is, it's just like this legacy that I just like, okay, I'm that share, you know, it's like it's this version of me. And to me, going on stage with Vixen is always about, um, I want to make the crowd feel good. 
I just always want to make them feel connected to, you know, I want them to, it's like, I always, I was coming back to being a fan. So it's like, what if this was the only time they've ever seen Vixen and they've been waiting for 20 years or 25 years or 30 years to see the band. I don't want to disappoint. So that's, that's where I was kind of come from. And then stage wise, I try to deliver that. And, you know, sometimes it's harder than other times, you know, maybe you're, you got a sore throat or you don't feel good or, you know, you sprained your ankle the day before <laughs> anything can happen. But um, we just, I think everybody in the band really has that as their MO, you know, like let's deliver, let's just deliver. And so um, I, I think that that comes across and certainly um, the positivity of, you know, Roxy, Britt and Lorraine is, it's unparalleled. It's, it's amazing. Like the amount of positivity it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you said that because I, I think it was about 34 years and I don't even know how I let this happen because you're one of my absolute favorite bands, obviously, if I was on the fan club, but I really didn't see you until you played, um, it was, I guess, five years ago now, House of Blues and Lorraine was still in Femme Fatale and opened up for you guys. So I got to see Vixen, Femme Fatale, all female version and Athena, who I had always, uh, kind of known about and followed so it was such a great night for me and and you guys did deliver I got to see you know everything that I wanted to see that I waited like 34 years for um funny thing about that show this is my self-indulgent moment maybe this whole I love it my self-indulgent moment but um so how much love I'm sorry um uh, love made me has always been my favorite song and Good song. so I've been listening to it for a favorite video favorite song favorite everything and I'd been listening to it for at that point, 34 years or so. And um, I, I'm standing like right up front, like right in front of Janet. And, you know, Janet usually kind of goes over to your microphone. That's like, you know, one of those things that like you expect yeah. to happen <laughs> during Vixen show. And you guys get to the, get to the chorus part and you sang it wrong. Uh, I was telling Bam the story as well. And I was like, why did they sing it like that? And then I was like, okay, I forgot about it because it's like my favorite song and I'm so into it. And then like that, that, that part came up again and I'm watching your mouth and Janet's mouth and I'm like, oh my God, I've been singing that wrong for 34 years. Oh no, I you're kidding. I was singing like love made me run to the truth. I can't even remember what it is now because I'm so turned around by like, so shocked by my own stupidity of singing this lyric wrong forever. <laughs> oh, it's the but lyric it thing. a shocking moment that I literally on the way home just kept listening to the song like, I need to hear it till I hear what they were actually singing because I've been hearing oh it. Oh my gosh. So, so, so long. Um, but I wouldn't have ever known that until that night because I literally saw I heard it. you and I saw and I was yeah. like, why did they why why did they change that one lyric? Like why did they change the words? One word. Oh my god. I didn't change anything else. It was such a funny, it was like such a funny moment. But I mean, I think we That's all great. have hands. Like we all have that like oh absolutely. You know, hundred percent a hundred percent yeah 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 what's yeah your yeah favorite, what's your favorite song of the vixen stuff um mm. all the vixen songs do you have one gosh that's hard um I don't know I probably changes like playing them live is one thing you know what I mean like there's certain songs that are just sort of they're just fun to play so um I, I mean, I always love Edge of a Broken Heart because it's where the crowd always goes, ah, you know, so it's like, great, you know, that's just super fun. And then um, Rev It Up is really fun as well. It's super fun to play. Love Mamie is actually one of my favorites to play. Uh, love Mamie. When we were reuniting um, for this big reunion and I hadn't played Vixen songs since 1991. Mm. And so I remember calling Janet and going, uh question she was like what's up and I'm like who's singing that high harmony on love made me and she's like that's you and I'm like no 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 she's like yes 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 I was like oh my god <laughs> that is funny that is yeah funny. I was like wow <laughs> damn she thinks she had some high notes there was that me <laughs> That's so yeah yeah it's funny but yeah um so yeah yeah we we I mean really it's just fun you know the the songs overall are are generally just they're just like good fun rock and roll songs to play and and sing 
they were great. Streets of Paradise mm -hmm. actually became it's hard for me to not love Love Made Me because it's been my favorite forever and it's just it's just my kind of song. But when I saw you live, Streets in Paradise to me became sort of the other favorite. Oh, interesting. I loved it on album, but live it was just it was just a different thing altogether. Yeah. 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 I think that's true with probably, you know, um, I don't know, maybe some of the songs for sure. Streets in Paradise is definitely one of them. I mean, when I hear the live version, I was like, hmm, interesting. But uh, I mean, the live version I think is is stronger than the recorded version. That's I think what I'm trying so. To say. I think yeah. live it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although when you go back to listen to the recorded version after hearing it live, it it became more powerful even on the album to me. It just oh interesting. It. Yeah, it was really crazy because, like I said, "Love Made Me" has just been the song, you know, the favorite wow. without any contest from any other. That's amazing. Other song, yeah, I had such <laughs> love for that. That's, That's cool. Love. So, um. I did want to ask my my last two questions for you um, is always like advice to other musicians. And in your case, I would love to know if you had any advice for musicians who um, maybe are starting out, you know, and just want to know, like, what is it? What is it that you know that you've learned that you would like to pass on? But I'd also love your advice for bass players. Um, oh, cool. Bass player could also be it could be more technical or nerdy or whatever, whatever you want. Right. Love your advice for those two groups. <laughs> I can get pretty technical and nerdy. Um, <laughs> so I guess like, you know, for, for general musicians, I would, my advice is always um, play in as many situations as you can, you know, don't say no and be all judgmental or anything. Just say yes, just go in there and play. Um, I think the, the biggest obstacle for musicians is we have a tendency to be super judgy. You know, we're all supposed to be so peaceful and loving, but man, when a different band or musician walks in, we're super threatened and we're like, oh, well, they weren't that good. And we're always comparing and judging, you know, I think in our heads. And so I think the best thing, uh, you know, a, a newer or, or younger or starting out musician can do is to just be really open, like really open your heart and open your ears. And just because that's not the music that you want to play, don't hate it you know, like give it a chance and then maybe check it out. And, and then, you know, maybe you don't want to do it, but at least give it a chance. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then play in as many opportunities as you can, anything and everything. Um, I always believe one gig is worth a hundred rehearsals, if not a thousand rehearsals, like being on stage with people with eyes on you is totally different than like, Hey, can we start that over again? You can't start over again when you're on stage, you got to just go. So, 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 you know, and then it's just like learning to use your ears and everything. But I mean, I think there's, um, there's nerdy things that apply to people starting out as well. I would say, um, start paying attention to sounds and, and noises and hear it as music, hear everything as music, you know, an air conditioner, a vacuum cleaner, um, a car alarm pay attention to it and start noticing all the sounds that you hear around you because all of that contributes to your musicality. And then um, actually go a step further. So when you hear a song on the radio, see if you can figure out the chords or the melody. See if you can figure out where those are, walk away and sing it and then walk up to a piano or a guitar, whatever your instrument is and see if you got it. See if you can figure it out. Because that was one of the main things I did early on to really, really train my ears was like just oh, Berkeley College of Music nerd time was like, you know, you had to name intervals constantly. You were singing them, name it, sing it, name it, sing it, name it. And we did it with each other as students. It was just like a game. Mm -hmm. So I think that ultimately, though, that really helps you because when you're playing your instrument, here's another nerdy tip. When you play your instrument, if you can't sing what you're playing, then... I don't think you're owning it. So every note that I play on my bass, I could sing my entire bass part. I could just sit here and sing my bass parts to you because I know them in, inside and out. Mm -hmm. And may, I might not, and I don't mean like you have to sing it like an amazing singer. I just mean like you should be able to kind of not just be guessing where your hands are going. You need to know what that note's going to sound like before your hand lands on it. So um, that's my technical nerdy stuff. Um, in terms of the the business side for people starting out, I, again, just say yes to everything. Just show up and play, show up and play as much as possible. Network, be the light in the room when you walk in. So people want you to be in the band mm -hmm. and then, and then 
check it out, you know, join, join every situation that you can. Um, for bass players, um, nerdy, super nerdy point, make your pinky very strong. Um, I used to create my own pinky strengthening exercises because as a bass player, um, this ten, these two tend to want to work together. And if you separate them, then this one doesn't want to do anything. And so what happens is it flies off the fretboard all the time. And so what I found was I created all these exercises of like forcing my fingers to be, I call them spider exercises of just all these things involving my pinky to strengthen it. And um, another bass player tip, which I got from Jimmy Jam, who was in Morris Day in the time. And then he became the producer for Janet Jackson, blah, blah, blah. We used to go to the same music store in Minnesota. And so we met there and he was like, oh my God, you know, like show me how to play a walking bass line. And I'll, I'm like, I'll show you how to play a walking bass line if you show me how to play a slapping bass line. And so we gave each other a bass lesson. Um, I, if I can call it that, Jimmy Jam, well, Jimmy Jam, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, so I showed him like this walking bass stuff. And then he showed me like the basics of slapping. And um, which you see in Vixen bass solos online at like Cologne, Germany, I think has one. And all that slapping stuff, um, that was launched by Jimmy Jam. So thank you. And, um, but he gave me this great tip, which was if you can't walk in place, and play your bass at the same time, you are not grooving. And if you ain't grooving, not happening. Mm. And so that used to be some, I was a bass teacher for a while and I used to get my students to do that. And uh, they would really struggle at first. And I would be like, if you can't do that, then you need to simplify what you're playing until you can do it to the part that you wanna play. Because. Mm -hmm. Bass doesn't, any instrument, if it's guitar or whatever, it's not coming from here. It's coming from your whole body. It needs to be in your whole body. So that was the, that's the theory behind that is if you're walking in place, you just walk, just, just your body has rhythm. Just use the rhythm in your body. Yeah. So like just walk in place and play it and then watch what happens because magic will happen. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> it's from a bass player to all the bass players in the world. There you go. There you go. Yeah. All right, here. Well, thank you so much for being a guest. Um, it's been an absolute honor to talk to you. I loved um, kind of learning about Vixen and I'm so excited um, for whatever, you know, whatever you guys uh, do next. And I can't wait to see you guys live again to see what other songs I don't know the lyrics to. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Love made me blind. It's the truth. Yep. Now I know. <laughs> <laughs> or in my case, love made me blonde. It's the truth. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah. All right. Thanks, Sarah. It was really lovely chatting with you.